Hi, everybody. Uh, my name is not Annie Nascenti. Um, our moderator is uh, stuck in traffic, but on our way here, and very soon she'll relinquish me of this uh, otherwise pleasant duty of uh, uh, moderating uh, temporarily this panel here today. I'm very pleased to have this group of artists here with us today. I think they're going to talk about um, uh, some stuff having to do with comics um, th that really puts comics in contact with a lot of events that are relevant to the world we live in. Um, and I think that's important because one of the things about comics is that they're personal. One person can draw them. Uh, they're affordable. Anyone can do them. Um, they can be uh, a voice for the marginalized uh, as well as you know entertainment and high art and all these other things uh, that, that comics can also do. Um, and you know I think also one of the things to think about with comics and um, popular movements and marginalized voices to think about is that comics themselves have been a marginal medium for so long. They've been degraded uh, for so much of their own history. Um, so it kind of makes sense that comics can also be uh, a place where marginalized voices can be represented. So uh, to that end, we're very happy to have these panelists with us here today who I think can all speak to different aspects of that topic. I would like to introduce uh, on my right, your left, uh, Christopher Cardinal. Christopher has worked in a variety of mediums. Uh, he's produced children's books, comics. He's currently working on a graphic novel. But also, Christopher does a lot of work with communities, uh, mural work um, uh, that speaks to a lot of different kinds of issues that we'll see some examples of. Uh, to my immediate right uh, is Seth Tabachman, uh, who has, uh, gosh, a list of accomplishments that, that maybe we could spend a whole hour talking about. Uh, but Seth is the author of numerous important works uh, including You Don't Have to Fuck People Over to Survive uh, and War in the Neighborhood. He's the co-founder of World War III Illustrated Magazine. Uh, not only has he represented protest movements and marginalized voices, his graphics have been used uh, in protest movements and as street art. I've seen people walking around uh, wearing, you know, like obviously homemade patches with his images on them sewn onto their jackets and uh, it's, it's Really exciting when when art can have that kind of use value, uh, even you know outside of of, of the the commodification of art. Uh, to my immediate left is Mike Dawson, the author of several graphic novels, including Freddie and Me, and his most recent Angie Bongiolati. Did I pronounce that correctly? Okay. Um, and uh, th this book, uh, I'm really ha glad to have Mike here uh, today because this book. Um, it's kind of an interesting twist on our subject because it's a fictional book that's set against the backdrop of the real protest movements of uh, against the World Economic Forum. And please welcome Annie Nascenti, who just made it here in a cab. Okay. <laughs> yes. All right. It's okay. I'll I'll relinquish the chair to you. And uh, I was actually just about to introduce uh, all the way to the very left, my very left, uh, Sophie Yanow. Uh, whose book, The War of Streets and Houses, is about recent student uh, protests in Montreal. And uh, also, you don't need to bring a chair, you're going to take mine. Uh, please welcome our moderator, uh, Annie Nascenti. Thank you. Thank you. Um, well, we were just introduced, and uh, my name is Christopher Cardinale, and uh, hi. Um, I'm a contributing member of World War III Illustrated Magazine, so uh, that's, uh, Seth is one of the founders of that, and uh, I've been doing comics and community murals here in New York City since I moved here in 2000, uh, and before that in Mexico City and, and New Mexico. Um, and uh, currently I'm doing comics about uh, cycling in New York from a kind of environmentalist perspective. What kind of, what, cycling? Yeah. Oh, being on a bicycle in New York. Yeah. Oh, cool. Um, I used to be the editor of High Times Magazine and I did activist comics in the magazine and we had this one comic, Susie Squatro, which was done by 
Farrell Darrell Rumpel. Did I say his name right? You guys know his work? And it was about a bike messenger in New York who believed in Medmar, you know? Um, so are, are you a cyclist yourself? Yeah, definitely. And you, what kind of activism do cyclists do? Is it sort of like, uh, remember that book when you were a kid called The Pushkin, Pushpin War, where the little carts had a war against the Mack trucks? Do you remember that? No. no? <laughs> Basically, all these little push cart guys got pea shooters and would flatten the tires of Mack trucks because the Mack trucks would always knock them off the road, which I think is happening to bicyclists a bit. Right, definitely, yeah. Um, I'm in a, a show with the organization called Bicycle Utopia, and it's called Am I Invisible? So that kind of, you know, that, that's how you may feel if you decide to ride a bike in the city. Um, and uh, what we do, you know, I've done, I've done murals in, in collaboration with an organization named uh, Brownsville Community Mural Project and Transportation Alternatives, which many of you may have heard of if you've uh, um, lived here in New York City. But, um, you know, we did a mural on Third Avenue in Brooklyn and Butler Street uh, commemorating um, children who had been <coughs> killed while crossing the street in the crosswalk um, with the light. Uh, and uh, Third Avenue is a major north-south thoroughfare on Brooklyn. And so um, they, uh, they were trying, there was a traffic calming plan that had been you know, given to the DOT, paid for by communities in that area, that they had just sat on while people kept dying. You know? So we did this mural, and uh, it was to put a spotlight on this issue and push them to implement some of these traffic calming, the city, the Department of Transportation, some of these traffic calming uh, measures um, and there was direct action that went along with that, you know, actually putting things out in the street uh, to make the intersections smaller, to bring out the corners called bulb outs mm -hmm. and, uh, and such. And, um, you know, they, they announced, the pressure did work and the DOT announced at our, you know, um, dedication ceremony, which had the families of these kids who had been killed at it. Uh, that they were going to start Im implementing these measures. And, and this is your work right here? Yeah. Uh, the Woody Guthrie song, huh? No. Uh, well, I mean, this song has been covered by many, many people. Um, who wrote it? Which side are you on? Who, I, well, thought, I thought Woody Guthrie wrote that song. No. He who? Didn't. Oh, um, I'm blanking because I'm under pressure. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's Woody Guthrie. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it was, it was, it was um, written by a woman in oh. Harlan, Kentucky. Um, and like I said, I'm, I'm uh, blanking because I'm uh, stressing right now. Oh, but, uh, <laughs> don't stress. Uh, Everybody out there looks very friendly. I have this, this name <laughs> hang up. But um, the woman whose name will come to me in a moment, um, she um, wrote the song during the strikes in the uh, 19, <clears throat> around 1930 and uh, in Harlan, Kentucky, and um, this, her name is Florence Reese. All right, thank you. Uh, and uh, her husband was an organizer and um, a miner, and uh, they ended up using her songs for these strikes. So this tells the story of uh, the family and from the point of view of one of the children. So basically, she wrote the song while the gun thugs, you know, the private, uh, security that the mine owners hired to break the mm. strike uh, were shooting up their house at night. The, the father had gone to hide in the hills because uh, they were told that he, they were gonna, he was going to be killed. And they came and shot up the house while the, the, um, the mother, Florence, and her seven children were in the house. So this is a children's book story that I illustrated. And it was uh, written I by... I want to um, also get to your mural work. I'm going to bring the other panels Great. in first. And then... I brought a USB port with your murals on it. Is there some tech person here still? No? Is there a USB there port? There might be one in there. Okay. All right, I'm going to let someone else do this for me. 
<laughs> but I brought, I brought everybody's work on a USB port. But I'm going to move on to um, Seth. Uh, I actually lived through one of the books that you did about the um, squatting in the 80s was really hit me hard because I lived through that. And I thought you did a fabulous job chronicling, I don't know if everyone knows about this, I'm gonna let Seth talk about it, but it's, it's really about how, and it's still very relevant today, his book, because it's about how artists and musicians and pioneer types go into neighborhoods that they then you know, live in, even though they have to walk, you know, five miles to a grocery store or whatever. And then as soon as they gentrify the place, the developers come in. It's probably going to happen in Detroit next. But if you want um, My name is Seth Tabachman, and I've been doing comics about political struggles since uh, 1979 when we started the magazine World War III. Some of my work has been about the squatters movement in the 1980s, which was a movement where people seized buildings to make homes for themselves and then had to fight off the city to keep them and succeeded in getting ownership of about uh, 15 buildings in lower Manhattan. Um, and I've also done artwork on a number of issues, including I did some artwork for Occupy, I did artwork against the banks. Um, and um, currently working on a number of projects, including just some comic strips about my mother's death, which are in the latest issue, World War III Illustrated, and um, working on a sort of metaphorical piece called The Phoenix about the destruction and recreation of radical movements, which happens over and over again. You know, that sort of inspired to do that when I was at Occupy, and, you know, realizing that I'd been at the same place before several times. Um, so that's what I'm doing. And look at this fabulous cover. It's really beautiful. Um, so you have, a, you have a lot of different styles. How, um, how do you decide which style to use for which scene? Well, I always feel like the content of your work determines what formal devices you want to use. I don't, I know a lot of people feel, oh, I've got to have a particular style because basically it's a marketing strategy. It's like, say, okay, I draw this way so an art director can hire me to draw yes. this way. Um, and so people limit themselves that way. I feel like if I do a 30 page comic strip, I've drawn 30 pages the same way. I want to do something different next time. So I sort of choose my formal devices based on the content of the work and say, what does this work demand in terms of layout, in terms of um, does it want to be flat black and white? Does it want to have grayscale images? Does it want to be in color? Does it want to be a stencil? You know, I try to suit each thing to the content of the piece. I'm trying to show slides as yeah. you talk about it. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, so that, here's that's, a... Yeah, that's in pencil and wash, which is very different than the work before it. Um, very <laughs> much in the early 1980s, I did a type of stylized, symbolic figure that could be everyone. Mm -hmm. And then um, as I got more involved in activism and actually had stories of things that had happened as opposed to just things I was advocating, I started to want to be able to talk about individuals more and to talk about personal character and the interaction between people in social struggles so that I felt I needed a more sort of realistic representational style. So I move around stylistically based on content. Is that a stencil? That's a stencil which we used to spray paint on the sidewalk in Lower Manhattan. What's the status of stenciling now? Is it illegal? It's always been illegal. Always been illegal. Um, unless you can, yeah. unless you're Banksy and you can mm -hmm. cut cut the wall out and, and auction it off. <laughs> um, it's still illegal for it's him still too. Still illegal. Yeah. Um, it's interesting. Stenciling has this really interesting radical history that uh, stencil art was used a lot in the Russian Revolution because mm -hmm. the printing presses were closed um, during the Russian Civil War because everybody was fighting the Russian Civil War and. Uh, if you can imagine communist organizations without printing presses. Um, 
So they had artists cut stencils and reproduce mm. um, images to illustrate their ideas. And they actually had, um, they would send out the text on telegraph to different parts of the country. And people would make these sort of weekly stencil newspapers that would be put up around the city. Um, so that's sort of the history of that art form. And it sort of still influences how we think of stencils when we mm -hmm. see them. We immediately assume something radical is going on when we see a stencil. There's a, I'm also interested in the types of protest that camouflage themselves as something else. Like there's, I'm going to forget the name, there's that, um, there's a style of dance in Brazil. It's something, yes, and, and they're really learning martial arts to defend themselves, but they're cloaking it in what they, you know, show as dance. And there's a, a name also for when I was in uh, Cartagena, Colombia, Cartagena, Colombia, there was an assassination. That day, there was a new song on the radio that was about it but wasn't about it. They do this kind of like instantaneous protest songs that everyone knows what they're talking about, but they cloak it. Um, so the history of protest, um, it cloaking itself in another form is, uh, is interesting. <laughs> Um, let me move on to, see, let's see who's next. Sophie. Hi. Hi, this is Sophie. Um, Sophie, is, this comic is very beautiful. I read it last night, and it's just a fabulous, um, the use of space is stunning to me. I maybe talk about the architecture of the comic a little bit. Like the physical architecture or the... Metaphorical, physical. <laughs> I mean, because you do reference, um, you reference Hausman and yeah. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. I guess a lot of people have asked me why. Well, I, I tend to draw comics in grids anyway, which maybe is uh, part of why I like thinking about space a lot. Or I'm sure that's interconnected in some way. But um, the book is uh, in part about how um, space is constructed to control people um, and to control social movements, like people going out into the streets. Um, yeah. um, and you're from, did you, did you also do a comic about the, about the Quebec protest, yeah, tuition yeah. protest? So uh, the beginning of this comic um, takes place in Montreal, uh, where I was present for the 2012 um, student strikes, which if folks don't know about it, it was like, 250,000 people in the streets um, uh, demanding a freeze on tuition because um, they were going to raise it like 30%. And uh, Quebec has been basically the cheapest um, public tuition in North America for a very long time because uh, the students there are really active um, in protesting when things are threatened, basically. Um, and uh, it was just like... I mean, there was tons of street fighting and barricades, and it was kind of amazing to be there. Um, uh, but it sort of launched me into this, um, uh, I guess, interrogation of space, because um, yeah, I was curious about how, how space is constructed to control this type of thing when it happens. Uh. Um, I noticed that sometimes you have no faces. Is that on purpose, I'm sure? <laughs> Yeah, I guess I draw in different styles, and this is a nonfiction work, and um, I don't name anybody in it, and I also, yeah, like to to draw, I guess, in a style that obscures identity to a certain degree. I also found it interesting in the comic, at one point someone is watching, and I'm going to pronounce this wrong, La N. That's yes. it? That's yeah. not bad. Yeah. Um, and that's a French movie where... As I remember, when, um, when the people are kicked off the rooftops, they start hanging out in passageways. And also, her comic brings in the Battle of Algier, where people also con in the Casbah conjugated in alleyways because it was a kind of the only place where they could, I guess, meet to discuss uh, protests. Yeah, I mean, also in that movie, when, when folks are running from um, the the, col the French colonizers there, uh, 
they're running through these, you know, the alleyways in Algiers are not gridded like, like a North American city. Um, so it's confusing for someone who's not from there. It's kind of a way of protecting um, your own space and then also being able to disappear into the homes of, of folks in those alleyways. Yeah. Um, I love how this comic starts with Google Maps and how, you know, I guess how you walk roads that Google Maps tells you are there, but they're not there. Yeah. And then, and then you move the comic into um, true, true roads, sort of true pathways of life in terms of activism. And then, well, I don't want to spoil the ending, <laughs> but, um, and then there's this confusion, this notion in the comic that's really, really beautiful about how suddenly people are talking about, well, why don't I just go live on a farm? <laughs> So. Yeah, I mean, I think there's a tension of wanting to be in the city and like fight the good fight and wanting to just disappear and uh, get out of there. <laughs> but in terms of like maps, I think um, the Google Maps thing, like maps are traditionally like a really powerful tool of colonialism, uh, mm, like yeah. in North America showing up and being like, all right, well, we've got these maps, so we own this territory and like, no, we, we, we have this section and the people who are already here are like, what section, what are you? You know, and, and they create laws based on these uh, external substructures that they impose. So, I don't know. I think it's interesting. <laughs> no, I mean, I mean, the history, when you think of places like uh, Pakistan, where they just drew lines in the sand, literally, in 1947, and said, this is Pakistan. And you had, a, that was Bedouin, you know, herding culture and suddenly where they had been taking their goats for thousands of years now there's a line in the sand literally so yeah the history of of maps and then the other interesting thing you bring up is kettling yep <laughs> Dur during I've, I've been going to protests in new york my whole life even with my father you know against the vietnam war and recently i guess it was before Occupy or during Occupy? Oh, I know, it was the no RNC with, when, with Bush, no RNC in 2004. The cops figured out all you have to do is create these mazes and herd people like cattle, and then you're kettled, basically. You're trapped in that space. Yeah, I mean, in Europe, it's, it's been a tactic for a long time. And it, it was at the G20 in Toronto, it was like a hugely used uh, tactic like kettling hundreds and hundreds of people um, and the the police chief there got in a lot of trouble for that eventually um, but right now in Montreal they're still uh, heavily you know like there was an anti-police brutality march on the 15th um, they declared it illegal after three minutes uh, I was like okay I'm gonna walk out of this place that is going to be a kettle in five minutes and then they arrested 288 people um, oh. so. so I want to bring, let me find your artwork here. Let's see. Um, that's me. That's me. I mean, that's, that's my artwork. That's okay. <laughs> so um, I want to bring uh, you into the discussion. And um, what I, this is sort of like, there's a lot, it's like a, there's aspects to this that's, like metafiction, which you're going to explain what metafiction is. <laughs> but it's like there are guys working, I think, at a, t at a documentary TV show trying to figure out how to, how to edit life. Is that the, uh, the story is um, it's set in 2002, um, and there's a protest in the center of the book. Um, it's against the, uh, it was, uh, against the World Economic Forum that was held in the city that year. Um, it was actually probably the only protest I've been to. Um, and it's interesting to talk about the kettling thing because I think that I left at that point because at the time I was, I was on this march and I wasn't a citizen and everything got very, very narrow. And oh. <laughs> started to feel very uncomfortable. I was like, I don't need to get kicked out of the country. You're not a citizen? Oh, I am now. <laughs> <laughs> I became a citizen a couple years ago and that actually prompted... Um, probably had a lot to do with prompting me writing this book, because this mm -hmm. book is set um, a specific moment in time. 
Um, the main character, Angie Bongelati, is uh, she's an activist. She's with the uh, National Socialist Organization. Um, she works at a dot com, and so in her day job, they're um, they're making e learning, um, like so like documentaries, um, like for people to get degrees online. But she's trying to get people to to become involved, and mm. and so the story is a lot about some people who do become more you know more engaged with what she wants what she's interested in them become engaged in people who don't and the different reasons they have for doing so. Um, I mean, this is a fabulous cover. I love this cover. I um, okay, I'm not. I'm, I have a little mantra. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna. Forget You're not going to agree with me? No, I do agree with you. I really love it. My sister looked at it. She's like, oh, is that like uh, someone dancing at a disco? Oh. Oh. Like, oh. oh, no. Protests can be like that. <laughs> I'm like, it's not a disco ball. That's the symbol of the... Uh... It's the, well, it's the WTO. It's World Trade Organization. I mean, the protest that, was... That, the, the, the circle symbol, that's the, um, the global learning um, oh, systems, okay. the dot com she works at. Oh, that's okay. their symbol. Um, but yeah, so she was like fist pumping. Um, and I love the, uh, the, there's an old school, there's an old school editor guy in the comic and there's scenes where he's like stressing about things in, in bed and his wife is just falling asleep. Yes. And, and he has this one line that I love. I wrote it down. I like it so much. The, the guy at the, um, realizes that one of the talking heads that he's putting in the documentary actually plagiarized. And so the editor goes... I have an idea how to rearrange the words to make them seem like original thoughts. <laughs> and it's like, you know. Well, if you edit enough, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so that was, uh, I was interested in this idea that they work in a, that the, a lot of the characters are involved with this e-learning um, company because it's a for-profit enterprise, but you may be able to argue that there is a, a greater sort of you know, there's a good in it, and that, you know, in theory, you can, why, you know, there's a wider scope of education that you can give to people through the internet. Um, something that comes up in the story is the fact that there's still, like, a technological, um, you know, barrier in terms of people's access, especially in 2002, when people are mostly on dial-up, um, you know, modems, and, and this is, a lot of it's based on my own experiences, having worked at a lot of dot-coms like this, and, you know, learning about technological limitations. Uh, there's also a moment in the comic that I really like where um, basically there's a confusion about what are we protesting against. And I think that's an, a really important question. Our, when I started as an activist, the, um, you know, there, we'd have these meetings, these secret meetings where we would become confused. Well, should we go after the banks, you know? Should we go after the WTO? Like, who exactly is at the root of evil and we should be protesting? And there's this wonderful moment in the, in the comic where um, there's this confusion about who, who are we protesting against? Um, yeah, because I'm trying to think of like, uh, the part of the, the story, like when I, was, when I was a younger person, I was much more engaged like in, in these sorts of organizations and, and this sort of thinking. And then as I got older, I'd fallen away from it. And then especially when I became an American citizen, like I, America, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> kind of moment. I mean, it was a real thing like, because I come from a country, um, I come from England, which is not the type of country people who come from there, a lot of times they don't rush to naturalize because they don't feel so much pressure to do so because they come, they're not escaping, you know, to America. Um, so when I did, it was a very conscious decision to, I'm going to embrace this country. Um, but part of the reason I wanted to write this book is because I sort of wanted to, want, I want to sort of examine a little bit of what had happened to me um, in terms of my thinking and to sort of look at my, my feelings on, on society from, you know, different perspectives and sort of have an argument with myself through the book. Um, so there's people in there who so are actually to the, much to the further to the left than the, than the Angie Bongelati character and then people who are more, you know, reactionary I, types. I mean, I think that brings up a really interesting question. The idea that you would make a comic to have an argument with yourself or because I think that most writing is in some way autobiographical. When I look back at the comics that I wrote in the 80s, I was like, wow, you know, 
I didn't mean it at the time, but they, they were autobiographical. So maybe um, that's something that um, we can talk about. And then I, and if anyone wants to talk about that, and if you don't want to talk about it, we can open it up to questions of the audience. Um, well, I think, you know, you do, um, you know, reassess your views over and over again. Particularly, you know, as for me, as I got more involved in situations, I knew more of the complexity of them and I knew more of the contradictions. So that some of my work in the 90s was very much about what was wrong with the community I was part of, whereas the earlier work was more about, hey, guys, we got to go do something. And I think that's, that's sort of the, um, the stamp of someone who's actually involved is that when you actually know someone, you know what's wrong with them. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you can only romanticize something you don't know very well. So that if you know people, then you know what their mistakes are. You know what your mistakes were, and you know what the contradictions are. Um, does anyone else want to talk about the, that autobiographical? I mean, I'm almost saying like immersion comics. Like, you know, you immerse yourself in a world, and then you try and understand it and tell a story. And it, what often happens in kind of like war journalism, you can read a book where someone seems to know it all. They're kind of a know-it-all. And I don't like those kind of books because you, you can't know it all. And there's, a, there's another angle you can take with immer immersion journalism, which is, I don't know what's going on here. And so I'm going to try and find out what's going on here by writing about it. So yeah, I, I can speak a little bit about that. I mean, I identify more with that description. Uh, you know, you, you get involved in these things that you care about. And, um, and then maybe you write about them. So, um, when we went down to uh, New Orleans after Hurricane Katrina, you know, to do some volunteer work, and we worked with this uh, collective, this collective named Common, Common Ground, and um, I hadn't been to New Orleans before. I just was really affected by what I saw <coughs> about it on the news, and uh, had an opportunity to go down there and. We did volunteer work, you know, helping people get their houses and what have you, but I was also there as an artist. So I offered those services to um, the, uh, the collective, and they used them. Um, and then they just used our labor. But the artwork that came out of it, you know, I had contacted some, some, uh, some publications before I went down there. Punk Planet was the one that responded, you know. And they said, well, show us what you have when you get back. And what I did was just a, a collection of, of uh, the portraits I had done and other people's stories. So it, just in that process of, of uh, observing and putting it down, it's like it's not until much later that I would even understand what the significance mm. of it is, even if I do understand ever, mm. you know, just how com it's so complex. And especially also being an activist going into that situation and not knowing the community and being an outsider and then like there's race issues going on and and you're just like what is my place here can i really help anybody or am i actually maybe not helping at all mm. so you know that you know i saw that also when i lived in uh in guatemala you know i was there like right after they had had a civil war and I saw a lot of people who were there to help. They thought they were there to help, but I just thought like, man, I really need to learn about what's going on here before I go telling people what they need to do to solve mm -hmm. their problems. So. Um, and do you want to talk about, you do collaborative murals with communities? Yeah, this one, uh, this one was in, on Rikers Island. Uh, we, there's a bunch of high schools on Rikers Island and uh, we went in and did a mural with some of the <coughs> students, inmates uh, there. And uh, it was two lead artists and uh, myself and a, <coughs> and a gentleman named Bayunga. <coughs> and I can't pronounce his last name. It's, if you look this up on Groundswell's site, uh, you can see it. Um, it's on, yeah. Oh, good, yeah. Here's his name here on the bottom. 
by you again is um, and um, so you know it was, it was also just an exploration but when we do these murals it's we don't go in with a theme you know we go to the youth to uh, we ask them you know what what's this going to be about you know so uh, they we research you know we teach them how to research and then how to conceptualize how to create a visual image mm -hmm. of that concept and then how to take that to a proportional drawing that you can then put up onto a wall. So we did this with them. But it reflects our two styles. It reflects the styles of the lead artist. So you can see that figure in the front has a very different style than maybe those two figures on the cots in the middle or the graphics up in the uh, thought balloons. And you, Bayunga did the figure in the front. So you can see the different artist mm -hmm. styles there. Um, do we want to, does the audience have any questions? Go ahead. Um, that's a great question for people that didn't hear it. He's asking, what is unique about comics in terms of um, protest and activism in comics? Does anyone want to address that? Um, I guess the accessibility of making them and also of reproducing them. Like during the student strike, um, me and a bunch of my friends up there who are uh, cartoonists, we like got together and made a zine during the strike. Like basically just inform information about what what was going on and like um, kind of trying to combat disinformation that was coming from the other side. Um, and we printed like 5,000 copies and gave it out to people and um, it was like incredibly immediate, you know? So we decided we wanted to do this like, and in a week we had it. So, I mean, I thought it was like, for me that's kind of the reason why I do comics and also the reason I do comics in the style that I do. like. I could draw in a much more elaborate way, but like I'm trying to, you know, convey information and emotion and stuff in, in the, I guess the simplest, most effective way. And maybe it's like the graphic designer in me, but it's also just like, I don't know. I want that immediacy. Young man. I mean, that's actually a great point. Like um, the ability to to make something. Like so rap no, but so rapidly and like with such little like you don't need much in the way of a budget you don't need you don't need collaborators necessarily you can have a point of view um, you can put directly into your comics um, sometimes I feel like in the alternative comics world you know the accessibility is great you know people can make comics about a great many things but you know a lot of times I don't think there's a lot of people writing comics that are about like topics like big topics and you know like I wish more people would well, think about it and sort of try to write about stuff like that just to at least be interested because I think that uh, writing is a form of like, you know, thinking. Yeah, writing is a form of thinking. That's great, yeah. <laughs> Seth? Um, actually, I, I, may I tell a story? Sure. Yeah. Okay, because this is a story that to me is about why we decided in our magazine to document protest and not just to address political issues which was in um, the early 1980s, I was involved in protests against the bombing of El Salvador by the United States. And I was, my first civil disobedience arrest, we sat in on the office of uh, Senator D'Amato and you know, I'd never done this before and I was told by the organizers, well you just go limp and they drag you out. And, you know, so these cops, they chained us all together by one wrist on a chain and they pulled the chain down the hall, so we're like flying, held by one wrist, you know, it felt like your hand was gonna come off. And there was this Village Voice intern who'd been with us the whole time, he was singing along with us, he was clapping, he was like a really great guy. And so I thought, okay, well, I just got the shit kicked out of me, but this is gonna be in the Village Voice, and we're gonna really make a big difference. So the next day, I went to see him at the Village Voice, and I was like, so there's gonna be an article about this, right? He's like, well, you know, I talked to the people here and they said, you know, things like this happened in the 1960s, but they don't happen anymore. Oh so we God. can't write an article about it. And, 
you know, so at that point I was in this moment of cognitive dissonance where I just experienced something which was the most terrifying experience of my young life and somebody to just told me it doesn't happen. <laughs> and so you can kind of do two <laughs> things with that. You can say, well, you know, maybe they're right. Maybe it didn't happen and, you know, I should just let that go and not bother them. Or you can say, well, now's the moment where I get to be an artist because I perceived something that other people are saying isn't there. And so I felt it was very important that we not just present political issues in our magazine, but we had to show the fact that people were doing something about it. And we had to make people feel you can do something about it. And here is how it actually works when you do something about it. So that protest wasn't made invisible. And I think um, there's been an awful lot of creativity since then about people taking control of media to do that. You know, the whole, you know, movement of people like, you know, pulling out their cell phone at, at protests, recording something and putting it on the internet, which of course wasn't possible when we did uh, the first issues of World War III Illustrated. So that people have gotten the idea that you have to create your own media to document this stuff or it disappears. And so to me, I think that's why showing the process of political activism along with showing the issues is very important. Chris? Christopher? Chris? What do you like? I, I know, it's, uh, I was going to say, yeah. like, it's really, to, for your mural work to be in this room, yeah, it's, I know. It's, they're fabulous. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're violently <laughs> fabulous. <laughs> yeah, there, there's a lot of interesting artwork in this building. Seth and I were talking about it, it, it Yeah, it's amazing all of the impressionist <laughs> technique, the subtle light and color and these completely macho militarist murals. <laughs> you know. Yeah, so uh, I was lost a little bit there. But, um, you know, I, I have uh, kind of back to the, the thing earlier about seeing comics. You know, I've seen some obsessed comics, just one-page comics, you know, we paste it up. And... And it's, I like them when they explain, you know, I, I saw them before I moved here. And uh, some stuff about Mumia, Abu Jamal, some stuff about, you know, police brutality. And, uh, you know, somebody who, somebody, for some reason, they come, they, I connected with them and understood them, helped me understand an issue in a way that was, that I felt more directly than if I were listening to the news or um, watching a documentary even. You know, they just, and then when it's short, when it's a one page thing or a pamphlet, mm. you know, that I can get. <clears throat> you know, I got these at, at punk shows that I went to or what have you, or saw them pasted up somewhere. I mean, that's amazing to be able to reach out that way. I mean, we can do it now online, but you know, we can still put it up on a, on a one of the odd things about comics is, a long time ago, they were considered such trash. And you, you'd, roll, you'd roll them up and stick them in your back pocket, and people didn't really pay attention to comics because everybody thought they were junk. You know, and then this dude came along in the 50s, Wortham, what was this? And he wrote this book called Seduction of the Innocent, and he basically said, hey, wait a minute. These things are kind of subversive, you know? I mean, it, what he, his points were ridiculous and very unfounded, but then suddenly there was a kind of a shutdown of the industry. The industry really suffered. And then they came back, and in the 80s, there was a whole movement of, wait a minute, they're kind of like literature, you know? So they have this, it, comics have an interesting sort of underground history of, of subversion, you know. Um, anyway, I don't know what I'm talking about. Can we have another question? <laughs> I think there's always, oh, oh. yeah. Uh, oh. Yeah, yeah, you can go ahead. That 
Does anyone want to address that? I will if no one else does. <laughs> you know, I have one funny story though to tell you is that in the 80s I did, I wrote a character called Daredevil and I did a lot of like anti-nuke stories and I did these animal rights stories and I went to factory farms pretending to be a farmer and I got all this like gruesome information out of them and I'm not a vegetarian, I never have been. But what the weirdest moment for me is when I get letters or fans come up to me at conventions and they're like, when I read your Daredevil stories, I could never eat meat again. And I just don't have the heart to tell them that I still eat meat, you know? <laughs> but, you know, maybe that's beside the point, or, may or maybe that's terribly hypocritical and corrupt. I don't even know. So, go ahead. Yeah, um, one of the really neat things that happened to us in the 80s is because we had this very cheap printing, we had to develop a really simple graphic style um, to keep putting the magazine out. And that meant that not only could we print it easily, but other people could. Other people could Xerox it. Other people could trace it, you know. And all of a sudden, there started to be all of these flyers by other people using our graphics for their political flyers and other people using our graphics on their banners. They didn't even necessarily know who produced the work. They didn't credit it. You know, and um, so it developed a whole second life where the work was being used in political protest by a wide number of people we never met, you know, all over the world, really. Um, and I've seen graphics both by me and Eric Drucker and Peter Cooper and the early World War III people in particular who were all drawing in its very graphic style. I've seen them used in South Africa, I've seen them used in Germany, I've seen them used. You know, buy people up the block from me, you know. I've also seen people like alter them a little bit because they wanted to change one element so they redrew part of it to fit <laughs> whatever they were saying. And it was really kind of an amazing thing that we were part of this very broad conversation, mostly in Xerox, you know. And it was used in real events, real protest. And um, it was kind of my entry into a whole world of people because once people were doing that, I could then talk to them and say, well, yeah, I'm the guy who did that graphic you used. Let's talk about what you're doing. And that gave me a whole lot of new subject material as well. Uh, I'm getting a signal. There, how many minutes do we have? One more question. One more question. Mm -hmm. Okay, go ahead. I don't know if everyone can hear the question. It's a, ter it's a terrific question about um, what aspects of protest, besides protest, do you try and capture in your comics? And she mentioned how Sophie became interested in how people use space. So maybe you want to answer? Or? Um, I guess it really depends on what you're documenting. I think the other big thing that I was uh, documenting in that book is fear. So mm -hmm. it's kind of like space and, and fear and kind of being like, okay, I'm going to do this or okay, I'm not going to do this. Yeah, I, I think especially on the pages where um, people just, oops, I don't know where your work is now. People just seem to fade sometimes. And that was, that's very chilling to me when I would reach a page where people were just fading into nothingness, you know? So. Yeah, that's, I think that's a big thing in, when you're out in a protest and if it's like a really uh, busy, crowded space, you lose the people that you're with or somebody gets behind a police line and you're on the other side. And yeah, it's real. Does anyone else want to yeah. follow up to that question? Sure, sure, go ahead. I'm from Detroit and I'm a lifelong political activist okay. there. And as you may have heard, there are interesting things that are going on in Detroit these days. Uh, and one of the conversations that we have all the time is making a distinction between what we call protest organizing or oppositional organizing and what we call visionary organizing. And they're not either or, they both have a role to play. But I just want to throw out that distinction to all of you and for a 
just to give an example, so in Detroit, of necessity, you know, we, a lot of people don't know this, we, we now have 1,400 urban gardens in Detroit. Yeah. People are building a new economy that's sort of underneath the one that has fallen apart. And we put that in the visionary organizing category. But we think it's an untold story. I guess partly I'm inviting you to all come to Detroit and help us. <laughs> <laughs> Um, well, I think that, it, do, do, are, do they have the deeds to the land? Because if they don't, it's going to follow what happened in his... <laughs> well, a lot, of, a lot of it is guerrilla farming, and yeah. some of it isn't, and there are issues about that, too. Yeah. Like, you know, how do we preserve, how do we hold on to... A lot of what we've been able to do is because we had 30 years where what we used to call the bourgeoisie or the ruling class or whatever didn't give a fuck what we did. Mm -hmm. They paid no attention. What a great thing. I mean, that really has helped us in Detroit. Um, but that alone helps to illustrate this distinction between, you know, you could go pick a city hall or a bank or something like that, or you could plant a garden. Hmm. Long term, which one's, you know, building, getting us to the promised land? <laughs> These are the questions that, again, I'm inviting you all to help Does us struggle with. I think, uh, if I'm understanding it correctly, there's a kind of a visionary long-term form of protest versus the short-term actions. Uh -huh. uh, if, does anyone want to address that? It, I'm sure that came up in New Orleans. I'm, com I'm kind of interested in, yeah, in terms of New Orleans, definitely, and also in terms of um, your, your work with biking. And well, yeah, I mean, <laughs> dude, with protests, one way I've described it is, you know, I can define myself by what I'm against, you know. Um, and I can be, there's kind of a self-destructiveness in that whole approach. And then, you know, there's the approach of like, let's create a vision of how we would like things to change. You know, what is the solution to this problem? Um, I think the community garden movement has done a lot of that. You know, I mean, you have a neighborhood that's been redlined and things are, you know, landlords are building, burning buildings down and then people come in and <clears throat> plant a garden. I mean, that's a transformation that can happen relatively quickly. They can even create communities within those gardens <clears throat> where they have little houses and people meet there and they have campfires and they tell stories and murals are painted on the adjacent buildings, you know, it's like this is, and it, you know, it, it may not last very long, but it, you know, that can be an incredibly inspiring thing that can lift people out of some pretty low places. Um, and, you know, who better than a cartoonist to come up with a vision? You know, I mean, cartoonists can create whole worlds, you know. Uh, I mean, that's why I loved comics when I was a kid, and they were Marvel comics first. Mm -hmm. And, and there was a whole world that I could escape to, you know, as a child. And, you know, all these strong characters that I identified with. And as an adult, that didn't appeal to me anymore. Those comics, the same comics, you know. Uh, New Mutants or whatever I liked when I was in, in middle school. But, um, but then I discovered, you know, these, the activist comics, which, you know, they, they, I've seen some of these visions of how we would like, you know, our urban environment to be, and it's overgrown with plants, and they're, mm. you know, with me, you know, it's like, I would like to see, you know, that you know, cars aren't monopolizing the streets, you know, mm. and, you know, I have to create that vision, you know, but right now I'm kind of stuck in, in the vision, you know, as I'm drawing these comics about riding a bike, I'm stuck in the vision of, of the oppression that I deal with, I kind of have to depict that as well. And then, you know, imagine the other, you know, later. I think that what both a visionary politics and a protest <coughs> politics have in common is it's about a whole bunch of people working together and making decisions together, which is very difficult because we're in a society where we, we kind of are taught to compete against each other and to you know, be controlled by who's paying us. And so we never really make collective decisions. They're made for us already by whatever 
corporation we might work for. And so I think that the process of people working together is what is being recorded and what we all have to struggle with and learn about in order to do politics. Amen. Amen. <laughs> uh, should I wrap this up? Yes, I'm getting the sign. Well, I want to thank you all for coming and I want to thank the panelists and I gorged myself on all your comics last night and I just had such a good time. They're all so fantastic. So thank you for coming. Mm -hmm.